So, uh, friends, Vijay Sathiraj, who was, who was going to be ordained a priest on Friday, Vijay was supposed to preach this morning. Vijay has what I can only imagine is a beautiful sermon on, on, on these weird lessons. Um, <laughs> I, 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 Vijay, if you're out there, I hope that I get to hear your sermon one of these days, because I think you were planning on preaching on 1 Corinthians, that whole shun fornication bit. This is not a morning when I feel called to pick apart Paul's words about fornication and prostitutes especially when those words are bracketed with what, to my mind, are two of the very best stories in the whole Bible, the calling of the prophet Samuel in Hebrew scripture, and then the calling of Nathaniel in the Gospel of John. These are two stories that were imprinted very early on me as a child. The John story, the calling of Nathaniel, because that is where my name comes from. We spell it in my family the Greek way, the way it's spelled in this story, A-E-L, not I-E-L. And when your parents give you a name that comes out of a out of a story like this one, you tend to kind of go back and mine that story every time you're trying to figure out once again who you really are and what God wants from you. So this story from the Gospel of John, Nathaniel underneath the fig tree, his snarky little smart an smart ass answer, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then his, his immediate response to Jesus when he realizes that this is a guy who can see into his very core, Rabbi, you are the Messiah, you are the, the King of Israel. I've gone back to the story over and over again throughout the years, every time that I'm, I'm kind of struggling with my own sense of, of call and vocation. But as a, as a child, it was the Samuel story that impressed me the most. I remember being probably seven or eight or nine years old. In my memory, I was upstairs in my bedroom. It was late at night. For the, for the sake of the story, let's say it was a dark and stormy night in January. That's kind of how I remember it. The wind and snow blowing. Maybe the power was out. The house was lit by candles. That silence that descends on a house with no power, where it's just the snow and the silence. And I remember lying in bed and saying over and over again, Speak, Lord for your servant is listening. That is what my, my Sunday school teacher had taught us to do after she taught us this story in Sunday school. I remember hearing it, and I remember her saying something along the lines of, remember boys and girls, God can if God can talk to a boy like Samuel, Samuel's probably eight years old when this story takes place, right? If God can speak to a boy like Samuel, God might speak to you too, all you have to say. It's like they were magic words that we were given. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What the Sunday school teacher did not tell us, but what I have learned to be true, as I've learned this story in a deeper way over the years, is that the words that Samuel are given by God are horrible words. They are pretty awful for Samuel's caretaker, his mentor, Eli. God says to Samuel, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears about it tingle. It's an indictment against temple corruption, we think. That seems to be the message that Samuel is given to take to Eli. It's actually an indictment in some ways of Eli himself and of Eli's leadership. God says, I'm going to punish Eli's house forever for the iniquity that he knew very well about. His sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. God says, I swear that the house, I swear to the house of Eli, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Imagine getting up for breakfast and having your eight-year-old mentee tell you that the iniquity of your household will never be expiated by sacrifice or offering, and that God is about to do something that will make both ears of anyone who hears about it tingle. Maybe we should not teach our kids to lie in bed at night and say, speak, Lord for your servant is listening. Who knows what God might say? I think that might actually be the point of this story. Certainly on this morning, when we gather across this region, across the country, wherever you happen to be, when we're gathering in our homes, many of us shut in by winter snow and ice, and we're thinking this weekend about another prophet who heard God's voice on a wintry January day, not that long ago. Martin Luther King Jr. was 27 years old when God first spoke with him. He had already been to seminary. He had his PhD in theology. Martin King was a, a brainy preacher's kid who was so steeped in the world of church and theology that up until this moment, religion was just kind of a part of his assumed landscape. It was, it was sort of natural, an, an assumed thing, not a chosen thing. And he was, it was sort of the, it was the family business, right? And he was becoming a star. 
are. He was a preacher who was gaining reputation. The, his leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott was, was putting him on the national map as a, as a leader of civil rights, and the pushback was getting pretty intense. So Martin King, at 27 years old, was struggling with this question, who am I to be now? There was a very safe option, at least a safer option, on the table, right? He could take over his dad's pulpit, as was the intent, the renowned Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. He could kind of stay in his lane, preach a, preach a safe message about justice and equality and civil rights, but mostly stay out of the weeds and stay out of the streets. More to the point, he could do, as I imagine his mother probably wished he would, he could stay out of jail. He was receiving threatening phone calls. He had two small children and a wife to support at home. And they knew that their home could be bombed at any moment. They were getting those threats. And actually, just a few days after January 27th, 1956, that is precisely what happened. The King home was bombed. Everybody was safe, but their home was bombed. A couple days before that, on January 27th, Martin King was at a crossroads. The bus boycott was not going well. The leadership was split over tactics and strategies. He had just offered the board his resignation. And he told the story various ways over the years, as preachers do. But every time, it was a dark and stormy night in January when Martin Luther King found himself awake in the middle of the night, wrestling with God. And as he said a couple years later, I got out of bed, I began to walk the floor. Finally, I went to the kitchen, I heated a pot of coffee. I was ready to give up. I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing to be a coward. My head was in my hands. I bowed over the kitchen table, and he said, I prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still very vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But now I am afraid. The people are looking for me, looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I have come to the point where I cannot face it alone. King wrote, at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced it. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth. God will be at your side forever. And he said, almost at once, my fears passed from me. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. The outer situation remained the same, but God had given me an inner calm. It was January 27th, 1956, just a few short weeks after Martin Luther King's 27th birthday. Harry Belafonte once told Martin Luther King's biographer, this country only loves a dead radical. Maybe before we celebrate the man with the dream, we should take a moment and remember the radical, the prophet who chose a harder path, not an easier one, especially then as he neared the end of his life in the late 60s, 1966, 67, 68, Martin King was speaking a word that made both ears of everyone who heard it tingle. The white northern liberals who had rallied to his cause in the 50s and the early 60s over bus boycotts and lunchroom sit-ins began to abandon him 10 years later when he started to speak out against capitalism and poverty and the Vietnam War. King told an interviewer in these years, it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee an annual income to get rid of poverty for Negroes and for all people. It's much easier to integrate a bus than it is to make genuine integration and, equality, and quality education a reality in all of our schools. It was fine to go down to Selma to march across a bridge. But don't touch Chicago. Don't try to integrate Philadelphia and New York and Darien, Connecticut, or Lake Oswego, Oregon. In those years, three out of every four white Americans disapproved of Martin Luther King. They saw him as an extremist, and they wanted nothing to do with him. His white allies, that one in four, were starting to leave him, and many of his black allies were abandoning him too. After he preached against the war in Vietnam, the NAACP, which was never his staunchest ally, called publicly for his stepping down as a leader in the civil rights movement. This country only likes dead radicals, 
But as soon as a radical gets a national holiday, we try to scrub them of their more challenging ideas, we scrub them of their humanity, and we turn them into a saint, stained glass saint. But Martin Luther King Jr. was no stained glass saint. And the words he was given by his God on that January day in 1956 were just as challenging to the white and to the black leadership of America as the words of the prophet Samuel that he was given against the temple leadership of his day, Israel in the 11th century BCE. They were both given words that made both ears of everyone who heard them tingle. And yet we long to hear the voice, don't we? I mean, maybe I'm alone in this. I do, all these years later, lying in my bed at night, wrestling with whatever particular issue, a particular sermon, a particular position on something. When you, when do you choose? That's a question I think that many of us ask. When do you choose the safer, prudent, longer game, right? The less glamorous, but just as important work. You know, you claim your daddy's pulpit, you make sure you check in on old Mrs. Simpson this week because she's not feeling very well, Martin. You baptize babies, you officiate at funerals, you care for the people God has called you to care for, that is good and holy work. And then when do, you, when do you offer yourself then to the crossfire of conflict or the pitfalls of politics, the anger and the vitriol and the violence that comes when you start saying things that make people's ears tingle, when you start confronting something that you know to be wrong, a system that you know to be unjust? When do you risk speaking out, maybe not against your enemies, but against your friends? Speak, Lord. That is what I was taught, to pray as a boy. I pray it still, although more and more these days, that is a prayer that fills me with fear, not always with longing. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, I think. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, but what do you want me to do? And when God comes, when God's presence fills the room, when God's voice is heard then with clarity, will we have the courage to act on the words that we are given? I don't know. I don't know how this next year is going to play out. 2024 is going to be a weird one. I am not looking forward to it. I don't know how this congregation is going to be called to respond to what promises to be one of the most brutal election cycles we've seen, the continued voices of hatred and violence that are rising all around us, a violence that often speaks with the authority, the claimed authority of God. It speaks in the name of Jesus. And it feels like a foolish thing sometimes to let yourself be that naked, that vulnerable, that open to God, to say, as I was taught by my third grade Sunday school teacher, to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I don't always know that I want to hear it. I'm not sure I'm ready for that kind of upheaval in my life. I don't think I'm alone in that deep tension we feel around longing to hear God's voice, terrified of what God's voice might ask of us. This is a country that loves a dead radical. This is a country that needs living radicals. So maybe it's best to let Martin Luther King Jr. have the last word on his national holiday. That American radical preacher whom we love to shut away in a stained glass drawer, but whose words prove, to my mind anyway, more and more challenging, more and more radical, more and more frightening, more and more prescient as the years go, I, years go by. There was a quote that I think Vijay was going to end with. We talked about subbing it in instead of the um, Corinthians reading. I think the letter from the Birmingham jail has just as much right to be in the canon of sacred scripture as anything that Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. And in that piece of American sacred scripture, King writes, I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist. Although as I continue to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from that label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. 
and Thomas Jefferson of all people. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question, Dr. King says, the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. He says, perhaps the South, this nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. Perhaps our world is in need of some creative extremists. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening.